do that all right. Hopefully we can. That looks good, Tim. Excellent. All right, well, thanks for the, yeah, thanks again for the introduction. Um, just, uh, um, and for the invitation as well, I should uh, mention off the, the start here that uh, although I'm located in Halifax, actually today um, here in uh, Wolfville, Nova Scotia, um, I ended up doing a little uh, kind of double duty on uh, conventions today because we have the uh, Maritime Federation of Model Railroaders annual convention, uh, which is happening this weekend in Wolfville in person. Um, it's the first convention in a couple of years because we had, uh, normally it's an annual event, but we had two years of, uh, of shutdown through the pandemic. So uh, we're back on here this weekend. Um, so I was over at that show for a bit this morning. I've dodged back here to the the hotel to uh, to deliver this here, and then I'll be back over there afterwards. So, um, trying to cover a lot of ground, but uh, happy to to be here and uh, to be able to do this. So, um, so with that said, I'll uh, jump right in. Um, so the presentation that I have here today is something that um, I have presented a couple of versions of um, previously. Started off at a um, a local. Uh, convention here initially, and then um, had been invited to present during the, the Hindsight 2020 uh, virtual RPMs that have been happening over the last uh, couple of years. And I had presented this in two separate sections initially for that, um, one of which was more of an overview and background on, on VIA and modeling VIA, and the second was more of an actual direct application of um, modeling things in actually working things into a, a layout specifically. Um, so what I've got here today is a bit of an uh, amalgamation of those those two parts. Um, so it's a little bit of a different format from what I've done before, but hopefully it'll all uh, work smoothly here. So um, with all that said, I will I'll jump right in and hopefully I can, there we go, control I screen uh, or my slides just fine. So here's a basic outline of what I'm going to work through over the next uh, about 45 minutes here. Um, there's a lot of ground to cover, but uh, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about why um, someone might actually want to, to model via. That's a, a question that comes up sometimes. I'm also going to look at some of the, the options for via modeling through the eras. Um, I know some of us tend to think of via as being a um, still kind of a younger organization, but we're, we're past 40 years and 50 years uh, since the start of operations is not that far off on the horizon as well. So lots of lots of interesting stuff over the the eras. I'm um, going to look at some sample consists, uh, which obviously are important for for the modeling aspect, um, and talk a little bit about what's out there for models um, and how that's changed uh, certainly over over the more recent years. And then the last part of things I'm going to go through is looking at two different kind of case studies for how you can incorporate via operations into a layout. Um, one of which we'll be talking about my uh, current layout that I built over the last couple of years and how I built a smaller shelf layout um, that features via um, operations, and then also talk a little bit more theoretically, I guess, about uh, my future layout planning as well. And I'll finally close off with some resources. Um, I should mention at the start here as well that the photos you see throughout here, any of the model photos are, are mine and uh, quite a few of them are, uh, any of the layout ones are on my, my layout at home. Um, other prototype photos and things, uh, if they're not mine, they're otherwise credited on the slides. So let's jump right in. Why model via? That's the, the obvious question at the beginning here. So you can see this, this fellow standing in his backyard up here, scratching his head as he watches this via train going by thinking, why on earth would anyone want to make a model of that? Um, I think there's a few, a few reasons for it. Um, the first of which is that there is actually quite a lot of variety. Um, you may not think that necessarily uh, you go and stand trackside today and watch some of the via trains going by, although there's a bit of a, quite the hodgepodge of equipment these days. Um, so there's some some mix in there, but um, certainly when you look back over the years, there's a lot of variation, um, both in the type of equipment, but also the types of services across the country and the types of settings where you could actually uh, incorporate things in or, or where you could, could work that around. There's also on like attached to that quite a bit of flexibility in there as well. Um, so you have much longer trains um, that work well for large layouts, thinking of things like the Canadian Supercontinental and those types of of services, but there's also a lot of uh, much more compact options, anything from RDCs through the, the shorter LRC consists and such that have become commonplace in, in more recent decades, um, and really different types of service across the country as well. So everything from the uh, more like mainline express type of services through to much smaller branch line operations, especially when you get back prior to uh, 1990, uh, the really drastic cuts that happened then. So there's a lot of, depending on your particular uh, 
era, locale, and interest, there's a lot of different scenarios in which you can incorporate some kind of VIA operations into your modeling. And the last one here is something that I actually, I've been really excited to be able to add to this list of advantages in recent years, is that the availability of equipment um, is actually has improved dramatically. Um, it used to be that was a major impediment to be a modeling. And again, as mentioned in the little introduction at the beginning there, that was for me something that got me into um, actually tackling a lot of um, more serious modeling, kit bashing, scratch building, that sort of thing, because there wasn't much available. And that in the last, uh, really the last, 10, 15 years has changed dramatically, largely thanks to Rapido. It's not a not a sponsored plug or anything there, but um, they've understandably been one company that's done the most for, for changing that. But when you get into available equipment, you'll see there's some other companies filling in some blanks as well. And the last but not least, I think um, it is a way of, of adding operational interest into uh, layouts. I know we think of often think about, uh, you know, the freight operations as being really interesting part of things. Um, but if you incorporate things right, passenger operations can be a, a very interesting addition to that backdrop as well. So moving right along, um, I mentioned that there's a lot of uh, variety and options throughout the, the eras. Um, so you really can divide via down, I think, into kind of sort of blocks through the, the time period. Um, again, we're just beyond 40 years since the beginning of operations. Um, nearing 50. And the earliest part of that, of course, was the transition from CHAN and CP passenger services into VIA as a new identity and operator, um, which makes for some really interesting stuff. I think it's, I mean, we often talk about the um, uh, Amtrak's rainbow era in the States where they had all of that amalgamation of different railways equipment together. VIA had something similar in their earliest days where you could see that mix of CHAN and CP via painted equipment, and all kinds of, of interesting equipment all sort of thrown together just based on what was what was put together in that pool. Then you move into the early VIA years where you start to have a uniform identity um, with the, the classic blue and yellow uh, scheme and steam powered or steam heated equipment. And then you move into the, the HEP era or HEP for head and power, uh, which really gets you into kind of the early 90s uh, moving onwards. It's a an unfortunate error in some ways because of the dramatic cuts that happened in 1990 and a lot of the fleet being thinned out, disposed of. It's the end for um, things like the FP9s and FPA4s. And, um, but the sort of uh, final years of the LRCs, the beginning of the HEP1 and HEP2 programs, and you get kind of different refurbished equipment coming in there as well. But then you move into the, the so-called Renaissance uh, period, kind of uh, post-2001, um, where you had the new Renaissance equipment sourced secondhand from the UK, um, as well as new P42s arriving. There's some expansion of services at the time, and then everything just kind of ground to a bit of a, a halt. And then moving a little farther along, we're into this kind of modern transition period that I think of over the last five to 10 years really, where you've had the refurbishment of a lot of equipment and then this kind of mix of um, unrefurbished and refurbished cars and locomotives. Um, there's always, well, there was, I had a new services note there for a while when VO was looking at some expansions, but obviously the, um, the last couple of years has kind of put the, the brakes on that. And then moving into the future, um, for those who, who look to, to model via in years to come. Obviously, we have the new Siemens equipment coming online in the, the corridor that's going to be replacing everything that's there, which will bring in a, an era of much more uniformity, but also um, some new things and a, and a period of transition that, that promises to be kind of interesting as well. Now, on to CONSIS, because uh, this is always interesting stuff. As I said, you can really, I mean, we often think of passenger car, passenger trains as being you know, huge and, and difficult to work into layouts. And it can certainly be the case that they can be enormous. So some of the long distance uh, trains where you get the most variety in terms of types of, of passenger cars, as well as uh, in those early years, the paint schemes and things like that, um, those also become pretty huge. And compressing that, you can do a certain amount to convincingly shorten those trains down, but there's, there's some limitations when you have so many different car types that have to be in there. Um, similarly, in the kind of through the 80s in the, the corridor, even you're still looking at often rather long trains, although you've got some shorter ones as well, but you have that variety of, of various um, conventional uh, equipment, as well as the turbo trains, the LRCs, RDCs, and everything else that was running through that. So a lot of, of uh, variety and a lot more uh, interesting operations there as well. From the 1990s onwards, consists generally have become more standardized and shortened. Uh, so you're typically looking in the corridor, 
<clears throat> at a single locomotive and some, anywhere from kind of two to seven cars, that sort of range. Um, sometimes baggage cars in there, but otherwise a mix of LRCs, HEP 1s, HEP 2s, some Renaissance, um, and some interesting things there, some of the, the joint trains and, and top and tail sets that add some variety in there as well. And then you've also got on some of the remote services where you got some, some interesting short consists as well. Um, I've got a couple of examples there of some of the trains in Northern Quebec and up on the, the Skeena from Jasper to Prince Rupert and uh, some things like that, as well as RDCs that have continued operating in a couple of parts of the system, um, even through to today, at least in the, the Sudbury White River case. So that's all a bit of, that's kind of my rush through the, the prototype side of things. Um, shifting into the modeling part of it, one of the obvious questions here, if you're actually looking to dive into things, you're convinced there's interesting stuff out there. Um, <clears throat> what's actually available for models? As I said, this has changed a lot. And actually, even since the first time that I did a version of this presentation, I've had to add a few more things or change the kind of coding of stuff to, to acknowledge uh, things that have, have come along since. So starting out with locomotives, um, the actual road power through the years. So in the earlier period of VIA, you had the um, the major power there is the FB9, A, and B, which Rapido has done um, very nice versions of those. Um, Intermountain's also done some that are really a, uh, I think they're an FP7 kind of masquerading as an FP9. Um, the FP7A as well, uh, which there were a smaller number of those, Rapido has also covered. And again, Intermountain has a uh, less accurate version. The FPA4 and FPB4, those are probably some of the most iconic via power when you think about kind of uh, classic marketing and, and stuff. Uh, those have, of course, been done by Rapido as well. You had some earlier stand-ins from, from Lifelike before that. The FPA2, I originally had marked as a kind of miss here, but maybe you could kit bash it from the FPA4 as well. Rapido is doing those as well. And even the couple of E8s, uh, VIA only had um, a, a few of these, was two or three of them, I think, that came from CP. Uh, and uh, didn't last terribly long, I don't think, in, in via service. But again, those are on their way as well. The turbo train, of course, the whole reason that Rapido came to exist as a company in the first place was to make that train. And you've got a, a new, much better functioning version of that uh, coming down the pipeline as well. Um, the RS-18 Tempo locomotives, which were those weird rebuilds that were built to um, for CN uh, to run with Tempo equipment, um, head and power for them, uh, even those have been done along with the Tempos. The RS-10, um, there's the Proto 1000 model that has some dimensional issues, but it's you know, potentially there as, a, as an option, um, although you could probably also work off a of Rapido for that. Um, the LRC, also done by Rapido, you can see that up in the, the photo at the top uh, as part of that lineup. Of course, the F40s as well, which have been the really iconic face in the later eras of VIA um, and still are the main uh, road power today. Um, in their rebuilt form, both the original and rebuilt versions have been done by Rapido. Again, there's a you can see a bit of a pattern here. Um, although to break that pattern, we've got the P42s at the end, which um, Athern has done some examples of in the past, which were really Amtrak versions painted in, in VIA through a few custom runs. You can see an example on the bottom right there of uh, a stock Athern unit on the left and one on the right that I've modified um, to be a bit more accurate for the VIA version. Um, of course, Athern is also now doing in their, their upgraded Genesis version of these engines, they're doing a VIA specific one, although it's accurate for the more recent kind of 20... 10 2011 post um, when they added the the extra headlights on there um, but those promised to actually be be quite nice and upgraded from the operational standpoint as well so moving on to uh, the lesser seen power the uh, the switchers um, there's via yeah, hasn't had a huge number of of uh, switching engines over uh, the years um, going back to earlier decades um, You'd see a lot of CN power uh, being used for that, thinking of around Spadina in, in Toronto and, and elsewhere. Um, so SW 1200RS was a mainstay of that, which you've had, there's been several um, options for that over the years, both the kits from Caslo, brass models from Overland, um, the Rapido uh, ready to run models more recently. The S13 was another um, common engine used for, for switching purposes. Um, that's only been done in resin and brass to date, although I'm sure it's on some manufacturers list of to do projects. 
Um, the SW1000, so we had four of these, two of which were in Toronto, two of which were in Montreal at their maintenance center there. Um, the two in Montreal are still around, um, 202 and 204. Um, the model at the bottom there you see is the Athern uh, ready to run version that I uh, did some upgraded detailing on. I've since uh, done a few more things to that particular unit, but that's a slightly older picture there. Um, Athern is doing another run of these uh, soon. They do have a few little little issues to uh, deal with, but overall they're a pretty nice starting point and they, they do actually run quite well. So then you have also, there's been a couple of track mobiles used around there. Um, I know for sure one in Winnipeg, uh, BLI has made one. I uh, think they're the only running one that's ever been done. It's the wrong style, but you could probably use it in a pinch. Now, passenger cars are obviously for the passenger Railway, they're the, the backbone of things. So um, that actually for the longest time was an even bigger sticking point uh, on the VIA front, but also has been been dealt with uh, in more recent years. So of the blue and yellow fleet, um, there's a huge number of car styles and variations in that fleet, both from the Canadian Car and Foundry cars and the Pullman Standard uh, ones. Rapido has done but a few of those, especially in the earlier runs, there's a lot of those that probably need to be redone or rerun. Um, and there's still definitely lots of gaps in there, um, but there's there's enough to kind of, you know, if you can track them down to give you a bit of a, a base anyway. Steam generators, Rapido's done one uh, version of those, which were obviously important for the earlier eras. RDCs as well, um, Rapido's done rather nice looking ones. Uh, they can have their operational issues at times, but uh, as far as an actual you know, convincing rendition of those, um, both in their earlier and later versions. Uh, they've they did a rather nice job. And of course, there's the older proto units if you want to do some work on those. Uh, the turbo was already in the other slide, but it fits in both categories. Um, the tempo cars, again, Rapido did a lovely job of those, um, which you definitely need if you're modeling southwestern Ontario. The LRCs, which are probably the, if you're modeling via any time from the, I mean, really through the 90s and onwards in the 2000s, um, those are the core of the fleet for the corridor anyway. Um, and again, Rapido's done a few different runs of those um, and the resin kits back before all of that. So there's some, some good options there. Um, some of them do need some work, but they're again, nicely rendered at the end of the day. Um, the one up at the top right there is one of the earlier run ones that I redid as a rebuild coach. Uh, the XCP stainless steel fleet, um, Rapido has done a variety of those cars initially as the Canadian sets and then as standalone ones. They don't cover all of the variations. They're also not accurate for the, the later um, uh, head end power rebuilds. Um, so they do need some work. So that's where I mentioned here, the uh, the HEP ones, if you're modeling again from mid nineties onwards, you can do these, uh, so most of these modified from the Rapido cars if you can get a hold of them. That involves mostly underbody modifications and end modifications, as well as some interior changes, a few window changes on some cars as well. Um, there's also some that really you have to, to build up and uh, Union Station Products and American Model Builders make sides for cars that can be used for some of those, which I'm not gonna go into in a lot of detail here, but um, if folks have questions about specific cars, I can definitely uh, follow up on that. The HEP 2s, which are the, um, these are of course the stainless steel cars that were rebuilt from various American origin cars back in the, uh, well, again, in the mid nineties, they were rebuilt interior. The interiors were built to match the LRCs. Um, exterior, they're the ones with the blue and yellow stripe, um, which are now being redone with the teal um, in the, the window band and yellow in the, the letterboard. Um, those, um, I have uh, worked with Union Station Products a few years ago to get uh, the proper sides done up for uh, all of the car types of that. There's about, well, I could go into the specific variations if anyone wants to, to know offline, but uh, those those take some work to build up, but you can certainly do it. And it's made it a lot easier than trying to, to kit bash them otherwise. The Renaissance cars, sadly, there's really nothing out there and I'm, I think the only way those are ever going to happen is as a 3D printer, a kit of some sort, um, because they're, of course, were secondhand from the UK. So they're built to the smaller British loading gauge. They have no other applicability, uh, like they never operated in the UK. Um, they And if you were to build them for the UK market, they probably need to be in double O instead of HO. So it's, uh, yeah, not likely going to happen. But we can hope, I'll have to find a way to do it someday because I need, I need at least one set of those. And then there's a variety of oddball cars through the years. Uh, most of those you need to really scratch build or, or kit bash at the end of the day. There's not a, there's the odd one where there's something close as a stand-in, um, but yeah, you just need to kind of, kind of look into that a little bit.
Now, I forgot to preface all of that to say, I've just been talking about HO here specifically. Um, there are, of course, other scales. If you, I haven't even touched on O or S or anything like that, but N scale being the other uh, big one, small one, I guess. Um, there is actually a fair bit that's been covered in N scale as well, um, as you can see here. Um, here, this is the, the the ultimate downgrading of economy class here. Um, so you see, of course, Rapido actually has covered quite a bit um, in recent years, both some of the blue and yellow fleets, the LRCs, as well as the, uh, they've actually got a more accurate uh, HEP-1 cars as well through their more recent Canadian set release and the F40s and uh, FP9s, FPA4s, those have all been, been done there as well. So quite a, quite a lot of options for end scalers as well. So that's all kind of the actual like model side of things, what's out there and all that. There's two kind of parts to modeling via really, which one is actually building the models themselves and covering the equipment and, uh, and that sort of thing. The other is actually modeling the operations of things. And the, one of the questions that comes up to me is how do you actually work passenger operations into a layout? And if you don't plan that through well, you can find yourself thinking like it can end up being really boring part of things. Um, you do need to give it some thought and care very much as you would with, with freight operations to make sure that it actually um, gives something that's interesting for your operators. But there are lots of real world uh, examples um, of how you can make things interesting, not just having things run through a scene, um, but there are, you know, anything from sort of uh, smaller like branch line station operations to actually modeling a passenger terminal of some sort. Um, there's various scales for that. Um, lots of examples out of the, the UK for modeling passenger operations that's very popular there. But of course they have a lot more passenger trains to, to work with. But uh, um, some of the things I'm gonna talk about a little bit on here will give some, some more concrete examples. Um, one of the things that does come up, as they say, is that this idea that passenger trains are boring to operate, and um, but say really that depends on how the how you operate them. Um, I think freight trains can be awfully boring to operate if you don't have that well planned out. And um, now, one of the questions: Don't they just get in the way of freight trains? Well, I might say, you know, that works the other way around too. Um, anyone who uh, spends any time riding via probably generally feels like in the real world it's very much the the other way around. But CN dispatchers might disagree. So. That's kind of the really high speed rush through the, the earlier uh, parts of things here. What I'm gonna move into now is two kind of case study examples of how you can actually uh, work some Zavia things into an actual layout context. And the first of these I'm gonna talk about is my, uh, this small uh, proto freelance shelf layout that I built over the last couple of years, which I'm calling Johnsville. I'll give a little background on that. And then the second part of it is going to be talking about sort of my future layout planning um, which is uh, modeling something around uh, the Alexandria subdivision, um, which uh, will feature via and shoreline freight operations um, on the line between uh, Ottawa and Koto. So moving into the first one here, uh, Johnsville. Um, you know, this via in a small space. Uh, when I, uh, so in my uh, current uh, apartment, uh, you're working with a very small space, which lots of us find ourselves in that uh, position. There's room for a switching layout, but for me, modeling is anything I knew right off the bat um, that anything that I built that didn't incorporate some kind of via operations into it was not going to be what I really wanted. I, I think that's always important when you're planning out any sort of layout is thinking through like the things that you actually want, it's kind of the, the givens and druthers, so to speak. Um, but thinking about those things that are important to you and that you want to have in in some way and then figuring out how you actually do that. So the solution to this dilemma, how do you, how do you work this in, was to build a proto freelance layout based around a small passenger station. Um, and this is for the prototype purists out here, get, get all up in arms. It's, um, it's a slightly fictional alternate history thing, which I, I wanted to have something that was a semi-believable story or a real world placing for this, but it is somewhat fictionalized to actually work uh, into this space. So it wasn't tied to modeling a very specific place that might not work that well. So what I've done here is kind of this, my alternate history here is um, hypothetically resurrecting the, um, the line here that used to run between uh, Prescott and uh, um, Ottawa. Um, so this is the, I guess we've got the uh, Prescott and, oh, I'm blanking on the other subdivision name. Oh, that's bad of me. Um, but in any case, this is the um, line here that parts of this still existed until, uh, well, not too, too many years ago. Uh, parts of it at the north end of that became what is now the O-Train uh, line, the north-south uh, O-Train. 
And um, in this alternate world, basically, I said that this line continued to exist, um, was taken over by VIA to run as uh, effectively kind of a second main line, but more commuter oriented operations. So that's the, the setting for things. It puts it in this Eastern Ontario setting. And also um, Johnsville there is a um, kind of a nod to uh, Johnstown, which is down on the river where I actually grew up. It's a little closer to where Spencerville actually is. So it's a bit of an amalgam of those names, just a typical Eastern Ontario town is the idea. So this is very uh, briefly here, the an overview of the layout itself. Um, it's uh, 18 inches deep, uh, a bit over seven foot long on the actual scenic layout. Um, there's three foot staging uh, cassettes at each end, um, one of which is mounted along a wall, the other of which can swing down when it's not in place to leave access to a door, um, outdoor door. Um, it's built on top of insulation foam on top of IKEA Ivar shelving, which was something that, that worked well in the apartment setting. It didn't involve having to have a lot of woodworking uh, tools and things on hand. Uh, the track's all Pico 8, code 83, uh, Number six and number five turnouts on there. Uh, it's NCE, DCE, DCC uh, system powering it, and it's designed for kind of solo operations. The idea here is I wanted something as well that would be focused around the passenger scene, but also had some interesting freight switching as well, because that you know something I enjoy as well. Um, I should also note you'll see from the logo up there. I've I've set this kind of in the early 2000s, that period while the Ottawa Central uh, was operating, with the idea that they're actually providing the, the freight uh, service. So a sample here. Okay, so a couple of sample operating sessions on here. Um, these are kind of based for like one of these that incorporates passengers actually having, again, freight and passenger operations uh, inflicting here. So in this scenario, you basically would have starting off the session, you have a via uh, eastbound at one end of the layout, Ottawa Central local uh, freight at the other end. Um, the In this case, the, the OCR local arrives in Johnsville takes a siding to wait to meet, via train enters, makes its station stop, proceeds to east staging. Then you have the freight operations there. And during that time, the via train at the other end gets turned around, becomes the train in the opposite direction, or you could swap the equipment as well. Um, and then you work in another meet before things head in the opposite directions. You can also set up a session here that's entirely passenger operating, uh, which involves having basically via trains at either end of things in staging, um, where you then have some combination of the two trains, both needing to arrive and make their station stop. There's only one track that's on the platform. So you have to work out some sort of um, kind of, you know, shuffling of, of trains around to arrange for this beat. Um, so I've kind of highlighted a couple of, of options there. And um, the actual specifics of that for each session can be set out by the um, the schedule timetable, the the idea of which train is actually running on time or a bit behind, that sort of thing. Um, and I'll, I'll run run through an example here so you kind of see how that works. So here's our actual um, hypothetical scenario here. Um, which I'm just going to move this so I can see this properly. So here we have, we're going to jump onto the layout here at Johnsville Station, awaiting the first trains of the day. So you can see I've tried to go for something that's fairly typical of these smaller Eastern Ontario stations. Got to get back on. There we go. So the first train that arrives here is VF540, a Brockville, Ottawa commuter train, which here is operating with RDC 6148. It arrives in Johnsville and heads in to make its station stop. So here we have stopped at the station, the uh, group of Ottawa bound commuters board, they've already got on the train. So their platform's back empty again. It's a little step box uh, sitting to the side. Now, after they're done, normally in this scenario, 540 would depart immediately, but they're running late this morning and via 543 heading in the other direction is nearing town. To avoid delaying that train, 540 has been instructed to back out and take the siding to await a beat. So they back out of the station. Here we have them just heading into the siding and they'll sit there hoping that it's not too long of a wait. Thankfully, a few minutes later, we can see VF 543 coming into view, headlights off in the distance there as they're approaching the crossing. At this point, the uh, distinctive K3 is blowing for that uh, crossing. Now here we have a pretty amazing bit of work, I think by our, our photographer here who has managed to teleport to this location very quickly. Or maybe this was a team effort. Um, so we have 543 arriving here with 6437, uh, rebuilt F40, leading an LRC consist, crossing the station road. Uh, just after they cross the station here, they'll dim the headlights and uh, slow to make their stop. 
course, at this point, they haven't dimmed the headlights yet, so they're currently blinding the crew of the opposing train uh, for a moment, and then they will uh, make their stop um, as they meet the awaiting train. And here we have them. Another view again, thanks to our multiple photographers or our one incredibly gifted sprinter um, who is covering both of the views. They make a quick station stop here. And uh, in this case, we have Toronto bound passengers who are boarding. And once complete, they'll clear straight out of town. Uh, since they're running late, they're looking to make a connection with a Toronto bound train at Rockville. And with 5.43 gone and clearance from the dispatcher now, we have via 5.40 re-entering the main to continue their trip on to Ottawa. A little bit delayed, but hopefully not too bad. And we get one final view of them here as they cross uh, the creek and head out of town. The great thing, of course, with the RDCs, if you're operating on something like this, is that when it comes to that whole business of turning trains, um, they're rather, rather easy to work with uh, that way. There's a lot less to move around. Now, of course, now that we've got the flurry of, of passenger operations uh, out of the way um, for a little while here, we have a couple of hours where the, the local Ottawa Central crew who were waiting diligently tucked in on the siding by the uh, recycling plant at the far end of the uh, layout are able to get right to work. Uh, they've got a fair bit of switching here to work through before they have to clear off again and uh, make way for the next group of trains coming through. So that's a little bit of a little bit of an overview there. Um, the pros and cons of this particular setup, um, I think first off on the pros front, it has made for an interesting layout in a small space. Um, one of the big things for me too is it's provided some good scenic opportunities, um, good opportunity to play around with scenic techniques and set up an appropriate location for via photos. Um, it is one of those things, of course, we all find probably when you've finished building a uh, a uh, model that you're particularly pleased with. It's great to be able to actually put that in a setting where it looks appropriate to be able to, to take photos and set up that sort of thing. That's a, that's a part of the hobby that I quite enjoy. Um, there's also enough freight switching on the layout to make for interesting operations, even without passenger movements. And I'll admit there are there are plenty of times where we'll go into operate um, the layout where I will just pull, I'll just have a um, you know, freight set up to pull out of staging and do some switching. And that's really it and no passenger train comes through. And I, I think it's still satisfying there for me anyway. Um, even as a IBA fan still, it's a setting that, that works very well. The cons of course here right off the bat is that the passenger operations are somewhat limited. Um, you are kind of restricted to the, you know, the manual switching or hand of God as it were um, to actually turn trains around or move them in staging. So um, those, are, those are definitely some drawbacks, but I think really at the end of the day, working with the space that I had, it's something that, that works well enough. And I think it is a good example of, you know, uh, seeing that even if you are working with a, a restricted space, um, it's not a reason to automatically rule out uh, being able to have passenger trains still in that setting. So that's John's Hill for you. Now, the next part of things that I'm gonna talk about here is uh, kind of future layout planning. Now, this is still very much in the conceptual stage. That's what I'm gonna talk about. I don't have planned out track plans or a space to work with yet, um, but this is around the Alexandria subdivision in the early 2000s. And I think this is a really uh, compelling, uh, example of a of, for a potential passenger oriented layout um, and that's why I wanted to talk about it here and um, I think some folks might might feel similarly on that as well. So for those of you less familiar with the particular location, the Alexandria sub runs from Koto to Ottawa. There's via stations at Alexandria and Castleman as well as at Koto and Ottawa at either end. Um, it is a via own subdivision or certainly in, in more recent decades. Um, it is a single track line with passing sidings. Um, there are frequent short passenger trains. See, these are a couple of really good layout friendly elements right off the bat. And one of the things that's really appealing about this is that Ottawa itself is a really, I think a really appealing station for a model railway, uh, partly because it's a, it's a run through uh, terminal type of station uh, with end, trains that start and end their trips there. There are trains that get turned on the Y, uh, just a little way away from the station. Um, but one of the big things is that it's actually a surprisingly small footprint for a major terminal. And I think it could be rather convincingly modeled with fairly limited compression. Um, and there's also quite a lot of operational possibilities around it. But the real, real like um, thing that kind of sold this for me, in addition to the passenger operations, of course, um, is that from 1998 to 2008, uh, this was operated, the, the freight service in that area and on that subdivision was operated by the Ottawa Central Railway, uh, which was a short line in the uh, Quebec Rail Corp family of, of short line railways, which was a really interesting operation. Um, they really need, their locomotive fleet was mostly RS-18U 
locomotives. Um, they also a couple of C424s, a few other interesting oddballs borrowed, borrowed from elsewhere. Um, but there's some really good operational possibilities on the freight end of things and mostly short freight trains. So this is all very layout friendly stuff as, as a lot of short lines tend to be. So as another refresher, that's where the, the Alexandria sub is. And this is kind of a very rough schematic of drop not to scale, um, just to highlight some of the, the points along the way. Um, so again, you can see the, the stations um, along there. You have the interchange with CN at Koto. You also have interchange with CP at De Bojo. Um, you have OCR's Walkley Yard, um, which is where their operations are centered out of. You also have a Glenn Robertson, um, the Van Cleek Spur, um, which which runs off from there out to the uh, Ivaco Rolling Mills and some other things in uh, um, in Hawkesbury. So there's some other uh, operational things off that end. So that's some of the stuff I already mentioned. Um, there's online freight customers near Ottawa um, on the the line sort of between the between Walkley Yard and the station, which I think some of that could actually make it interesting um, switching layout right on its own. You've also got online customers during this period at um, Alexandria, Maxville, St. Polycarp. Um, there's some, an impressive bridge near Castleman, which makes an excellent scenic feature, I think. Um, and otherwise, it's just sort of scenery that I, I really quite enjoy. And, but I think a lot of that is from growing up in that area. And um, there are also several sections of it that I think could be individually pulled out, as I mentioned, like that section towards Ottawa that could make a kind of layout just based around that, depending on the size of layout that you're building. As far as operations go, as I mentioned, um, so on the Ottawa Central side, you have the, the way freight uh, 440, 441, um, running between Walkley Yard and Koto, which during the um, later years of things was, or for most of the years, was a night train. Um, the early years was a day train, though, until they realized that conflicted heavily with the BS schedule. But from a model operation standpoint, those conflicts make it quite interesting. So I think reimagining that as a, as a day train is a good way to do that. Um, you've also got locals um, operating out of Walkley Yard, uh, and you also have the steel train, which uh, ran between Koto and the Ivaco rolling mill, uh, which at least over the Alexandria sub on that one stretch was a really neat dedicated train of mostly gondolas and bulkhead flat cars, uh, and just a, another interesting aspect of your modeling that end of the line. And of course, the VIA side of things, um, all the Ottawa-Montreal traffic is running along here, but you also have trains going in and out of Ottawa that have to be turned on the Y. Uh, Montreal and Ottawa is part of the Montreal and Ottawa subdivision still exists, as well as some other work around Ottawa Station, potentially. Uh, as a quick example here, here's a 2009 timetable um, section here showing just the, the trains running between uh, Fallowfield, or sorry, Ottawa and, and Montreal. Some of those run through uh, to or from Fallowfield as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, this gives you a little bit of a sense of part of that time frame. I'd probably be aiming for a little bit earlier in the 2000s, somewhere in the 2001 to 2003 kind of time period. Um, so you have a little bit, a slightly different timetable there, but this was just one that I had handy to scan for this particular presentation. I mentioned uh, Ottawa uh, itself. I actually just wanted to do, this is a quick map here. You can't see a lot in great detail, but um, gives you an idea of where some of these things are located for those not around this area. So the Ottawa VS station is up at the top there. Um, I very <laughs> kind of roughed in the, the blue line showing where the tracks actually run around there. You have Walkley Yard down the bottom, the Y up at the top. And there's also, um, you see the Canada Science and Technology Museum shows up there during this time period. They had a rail connection as well, and you had some equipment moving in and out of there. You have the National Research Council uh, facility um, that's served uh, by Ottawa Central as well. That's not in the part of not in this part of things, but still stuff going and coming from there could be quite interesting. And uh, yeah, there's there's quite a lot more you could dive into there. It's worth just kind of looking around. And actually, the, the city of Ottawa has an excellent uh, geo city uh, service where you can look back at historical aerial photos um, of the uh, the time periods there, which are really um, really really uh, fantastic resources as far as being able to see kind of what things look like and how things have changed over the years. Uh, so yeah, some great, great stuff. Uh, here is a little overview of Ottawa. And this is, again, for those not familiar with the station, you can see immediately, I think, what I uh, mean when I talk about the compactness of this overall. Um, again, this would be still a pretty, like anything done to scale is a huge footprint when you actually measure it out. But because of the particular layout of this and the fact that you only actually have to accommodate um, typically, in, in my area anyway, you're looking at kind of four or five car trains as, as an upper limit, and you could compress that a little bit. Um, 
you could definitely pull this in. And I think overall that that's a footprint that could actually be modeled quite convincingly in HO, certainly in N scale, it could be done really easily. I'm looking at HO as well. And this is, as you can see, this is from the Geo Ottawa uh, site where there's this great little, you know, it's, it's a super uh, user-friendly site. Um, you find the location you're looking at and there's a slider across the top where you can just drag through the years and see the aerial photos from that time period. So being able to see things, how things changed, at least in that area, is just is a wonderful, wonderful resource. So the rest of this um, now is just going to be some photos for kind of inspiration, really. Uh, so here's another look at Ottawa Station as well. Uh, credit there to the uh, Beechburg uh, uh, sub blog. Um, so you can see again what I mean now, uh, if you actually took this really out to scale, as you can see, we're looking at the individual trains there, this would end up becoming pretty huge. But again, I think you can compress things down quite convincingly. Um, the whole structure of it is, is fairly straightforward as far as a modeling standpoint. So you've got these open platforms, um, these large overhanging structures here that um, I think in the long run would actually could look quite neat. Um, you've also got a couple of storage tracks and things so you can get some interesting equipment moves around at the stations. So now some inspiration. First off, this, this photo here uh, from George Pateras, uh, which really, I think, uh, highlights some of the, like the actual particular, the thing that really drew me to the Ottawa Central in particular is when you see scenes like this. This is the steel train at uh, St. Polycarp. Um, and I mean, I, I don't know if you could do a whole lot better for that for, for sort of, you know, semi-modern era uh, short line railroading. I mean, that's just um, be a pretty incredible thing to, to watch from trackside, especially. Here's an example. Of course, we got to get to the VSF because that's what we're talking about here. Um, this is an example of uh, just some of the interesting moves that you can end up seeing on the Alexandria sub. So this is a, uh, I believe would have been a Sunday train here that there's one train I have to refresh memory on the number there that we typically operate on Sundays would run with uh, effectively for repositioning consists to and from Montreal because it's where the equipment is based um, you'd end up having uh, on the weekend sometimes these trains we effectively have two trains that's coupled together that are running through to Ottawa to be ready for the next day's uh, needs so while a lot of trains are typically much shorter um, this still gives an idea of some of these more interesting things that you can throw together and this is also another scene that is really uh, very typical of a lot of scenes along the Alexandria sub where you have these sweeping curves, uh, fairly open uh, scenery, but also uh, a lot of you know interesting tree cover. And um, again, single track with passing sidings, which generally makes for, for good uh, modeling. Another bit of inspiration here, this is a different view at, at St. Polycarp as well. Um, there's a couple of these uh, sorts of elevators along the line that also just make, especially on these really wide open uh, planes as you move uh, across the Quebec border uh, that I think just make really striking uh, imagery as well and a uh, great backdrop. And as you can see, this is also a nice little online customer here for the freight side of things. This is uh, one shot here of the bridge by Castleman that I mentioned earlier as well. Uh, one little part of it, um, it's a much longer span, but uh, you know, wanted to get a nice feature here with the Renaissance consist on there. Um, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful spot and also one that I think you could probably compress by a span or two anyway to make a more manageable uh, feature on a layout. Speaking of uh, Castleman, here's the station there as well. And I think as far as online stations go, both Castleman and Alexandria are, um, are really nice little uh, station buildings, but they're also very compact. And the actual platform lengths, if you look at things on, on uh, Google Maps, um, you can see the platforms are only accommodated for that those shorter via trains, so they don't eat up a huge amount of space either, um, even without compression. But obviously compression helps as well. And last but not least, I think this is the final photo I've got here. Um, this is just a one little piece of inspiration here that also kind of further sold me on things. Um, so this is a, a winter scene. Um, you've got a, a P42 hauled uh, LRC uh, set there on the platform that's clearly run into some kind of mechanical issues along the way um, and has had to be rescued by uh, this uh, set of Ottawa Central Power. So you've got one of their painted RS-18s as well as one of the CP patched ones, um, which are just uh, make, an, make for an excellent uh, weathering project as well. Uh, and yeah, that's just, there's an awful lot to, to like in that scene. And in Ottawa under the lights, uh, I think would be a, something that I, I really uh, look forward to finding a way to make happen in scale. So, so that's the the gist of things to finish things off. I've got a few resources to refer uh, to here. and. 
I, this has been another part that's been really exciting that each time I've done this, I've been able to add additional things onto this resources page. Um, because for the longest time, there was really, you know, kind of one one via book uh, around there, um, which is uh, Chris Greenlaw's uh, via book, which I forgot to mention on this page. I should have anyway, but um, yeah, Christopher Greenlaw had done a great uh, VRL book back uh, a number of years back. More recently, um, Eric Gagnon, of course, has done uh, his fantastic trackside with VIA books. Um, and those are just, I mean, invaluable resources if you're really interested, especially in the equipment over the years. Uh, his consist lists and documentation in there are phenomenal and second to none. Um, and the consist companion that he put out as well is just a whole book that's nothing but consists over the years and across the system. So it's a really fantastic resource. Um, his blog as well um, is a wealth of information. Um, but we've got a couple of newer books here via In Color, the first 25 years up there by Kevin Holland. Um, it's a great resource. And more recently, um, the book that's featured off to the side there is um, this uh, People Moving People uh, book, which was put together by Kevin Holland and uh, with uh, Rapido and the Via Historical Association, which also I should have just put a shout out here to as well to the Via Historical Association as well as another group to, to look to. Um, and that is a phenomenal, phenomenal book. I can't recommend it enough. And finally, there's a couple of references there. There's the um, Passenger Car Photo Index, great site for passenger car photos, and the uh, Canadian Passenger Rail, uh, former Yahoo group that's now groups.io, which is also a really great resource and lots of really knowledgeable via people on there. So um, so yeah, that uh, that brings us to the end. So I hope that's been uh, interesting and sorry, like I said, I'm, I'm more than happy to take questions here, but I'm also uh, always happy to follow up with folks um, offline as well, uh, if you have more things uh, that you'd like to, to chat about beyond here. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up and say uh, thanks again for having me. That was great, uh, Tim. It, really interesting from the equipment side to how, how to model in a small space. That was really a fantastic little layout you've got there. And uh, also your dream layout, which is pretty familiar to the people in SLD around Ottawa, uh, especially those old Ottawa Central RS18Us. Those are interesting to watch. Um, you have a couple of comments in chat. Um, one is, um, Joel Racine, who's a local modeler, you might know him. He, he models the Ottawa Central Railway. Um, suggestion you might want to get in contact with him if you uh, don't already know him. Uh, yes, you I am. Your, your big one. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know Joel personally, but I have, um, I've seen his, his stuff on a couple of the um, online groups and such and have uh, had a little bit of back and forth with him. So I'll definitely, he's definitely on my there's a few people there that I have kind of lists of to follow up with more as I move into to more of that uh, that stuff there. So, um, yeah, I appreciate the, the suggestion. Then we have a question from Bernard, uh, Helen from Mini Prints. Would it be possible to model in current day the Canadian train in HO with cars presently available? Yeah, so if you're thinking like current, current day, um, you would have there's a fair bit of work to do so the best starting point for most of the cars would be um, the um, the various Rapido Canadian uh, cars that they put out the issue of course with all of those is that they're the original steam heated versions so for all of those you'd have to at the very least do the um, all of the end details there's modifications to the diaphragms there's the addition of um, the HEP and communications receptacles marker lights um, bunch of changes to the underbodies as well. Um, some of those parts, um, I did, we did uh, recently, um, Mark Charlebois and I had had, uh, uh, let's say, I'm sorry, Briggs models, uh, Jeff Briggs, um, do up some 3D printed parts for the end details at least. And we've been working with him to try to get some of the underbody details for those done as well as 3D printed parts. So those are a good, a good resource um, for modifying those cars. But then you'd also have to, as I said, there's been some interior modifications. So things like the sleeping cars that had um, showers put in where one of the berths were originally. Um, so there's a window that got removed on the outside, a few other changes like that. So uh, for most of the cars, you could do it, but to be really accurate, you've got you've got a fair bit of work cut out for you as well as just tracking down the cars in the first place. Um, but the big outstanding one in HO anyway, which funnily enough has been covered in N-Scale now is the, the prestige class cars. Um, so VIA did the rebuild on um, a group of uh, eight Chateau sleepers and four of the park cars um, where they outfitted them with this extensive modification that prestige class, which is huge 
luxury rooms inside, very popular with the you know higher end tourist market. But the biggest thing with those cars is that they modified the exteriors a lot. Um, the biggest thing being that the the chateau cars down one side of the car have these huge windows cut out, which eat up right into the letterboard. And they're like the modification on that. Um, you'd be better off actually either entirely scratch building those or starting off with kind of blank sides and, and making them up because it's pretty substantial modifications. And the same thing with the park cars, you could probably do that from a Rapido park, but it would involve cutting out these, you know, you'd have to be pretty, uh, pretty bold and prepared to be chopping mm -hmm. up a good chunk of the car to do it. So, um, but yeah, it's um, again, the N scalers have got that one ahead of us and you never know, maybe those will come at some point down the line, but uh, <laughs> It's a bit of work. You have to be brave to chop up those uh, expensive cars. Uh, I wanted to mention another local uh, model railroad to you, um, the Ontario Lordnell Railway by Bill Meek. Bill is one of our SLD executive, but he's got a conflict today, so he's not online. But he, um, it's it's a kind of a proto freelance uh, of these Ivaco steel mill and the what was the CN Van Leek Van Cleek sub. So he's going to interchange with CP or CN, sorry, down on Glenn Robertson, and then uh, models the steel mill and traffic and so on. Um, so yeah, it's not uh, prototype, but it's proto freelance. So that might be also of interest to you for part of what you're looking at doing. Indeed, and actually, I, I think I've seen there was a um, I've seen a tour of his layout at some point on YouTube that I believe was done by Chris Lyon yes. at some point. Who, funnily enough. Chris is actually here in Wolfville at the moment. Uh, he's doing yep. a couple of clinics here at the, the convention that I'm heading back to after this. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, that is, um, I've yeah seen a little bit of that. It's uh, looks quite impressive. Which area do you think is would give you the most complexity for modeling via? I'm thinking like the early days, um, I'm not sure how long they did it, but breaking the trains of Brockville to go to Ottawa. And uh, you know, that, they still do that in, uh, in Quebec for one of the trains to break them to go to two different destinations. But um, so what do you think about the complexity of operations in the different eras? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, as you go back into earlier areas, you definitely get into more complex operations, anything more modern. I mean, understandably, you know, over the years has tried to kind of streamline things as much as possible and minimize those kinds of online um, operations. It obviously get harder as you get, uh, you know, with more modern equipment, it's got a lot more connections between cars and things like that. Um, but yeah, as far as complexity goes, I mean, anything, you're definitely going to be looking at an earlier era for more complex operations. So thinking sometime through the 80s, um, but Brockville is a great example. Um, and actually, that's why um, those familiar with what Jason Tron is building his Kingston sub uh, layout. He's working from Toronto to Brockville and specifically focusing a lot around Brockville because of the fact that there's that whole more complex operations with, yeah, the Ottawa and uh montreal toronto trains splitting up joining dropping cars picking up cars even swapping locomotives and servicing locomotives, all that sort of stuff it's uh that's definitely i think um i think brockville has a lot of merit and that was actually my original focus before shifting to the um like to the kind of looking at the alexandria sub um, initially had been looking at kind of around brockville and east of there because that's where again where i had uh had grown up and and uh, so, you know, I think the big thing that for me was a bit of a deterrent, especially looking at a more modern age, is just the, um, with the double track mainline and covering the volume of freight traffic, especially, and a lot of those huge, you know, the, the sort of run through uh, freights that are a lot harder to, to model convincingly anyway, or do justice to that. You need to have a lot more space. So I was really drawn to kind of an, uh, a focus where you could have a little bit more of a scalable kind of thing. So, you know, if I have all the space in the world to work with, you know, model the entire subdivision, basically, but there's a lot of sub components of that that you can focus in on as well. And, um, but yeah, I think if you want to look back at earlier eras, um, yeah, Brockville is a good example. There's probably some really good examples at West as well that I'm just not as familiar with, but generally anywhere where you have, um, if you look through the older timetables and see anywhere where there's any of those hub points where there's trains arriving from different spots and going out in different directions, uh, you could probably count on there being a certain amount of, um, of kind of switching and shuffling around of things. Yeah, um, do you consider that uh, like the blue and yellow era at the beginning had a great variety of equipment and they probably still had like parlor cars and things like that. Oh yeah. Um, so that 
I would say would probably be a very difficult era still to model. For the volume of equipment, yeah, for sure. Um, that's where you definitely get into a huge number of just oddball cars and, and things where you have like certain cars where you might only have had, you know, three or four of a particular, like kind of all the sorts of things that are never likely going to be covered in any ready to run format. Um, so you'd have, you'd have your work cut out for you, but I guess from, you know, on the flip side, if you're somebody who really enjoys building the models and having those things to work on and being able to have kind of a never ending list of things you could potentially build at some point, um, that's definitely an appealing time period as well, because, um, you know, the more modern you get, the less and less variety you have. So, you know, I'm sure you have, you still need a, you know, sizable fleet if you're going to model any like volume of operation, but, um, the variety within that um, goes down, which also means the opportunity of things to build kind of shrinks as well. <laughs> so um, I don't think we have a couple of comments like, thanks, Tim. Good to see the possibilities and see some Ottawa trains again from my friend Graham Stokes out in BC. He got up early. <laughs> and um, also Brian Helen said, thank you. Excellent presentation. And I'd certainly like to build on that. It's been an excellent uh, presentation. And thank you for joining us today. And I hope the rest of your presentation uh, presentations may go well today. We're unfortunately missing some people from uh, that area because